you have a Bible, go ahead and open up to Jonah chapter 4. Jonah chapter 4 is where we are headed today as we begin to wrap up our time in Jonah this fall. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of, of series, whether it's book series or movie series or whatever, that are very popular and that people love to gather around and watch over and over and over again. I don't know what it is for you, right? I mean, it could be Star Wars, it could be Lord of the Rings, it could be the Harry Potter movies, it could be something else. Um, but, but there are a lot of these series and films and things. But here's the thing, at least in my experience, even though we love watching these series over and over again, probably the first in the series is the one we've seen the most times uh, or read the most times. And then the second one we've seen many times as well, but probably not as many as the first. And then the third, we've probably seen a little bit fewer times than the first one or the second one, and just on it and on it goes. Um, this is true with many series and stories that we uh, read or watch, and I think the same thing is true with the story of Jonah. Um, Jonah chapter 4 is the last chapter in the story, and it's probably the least known chapter in the whole book right? We know that Jonah fled away from God. Everybody knows that Jonah got swallowed up by a big fish. Some people know that Jonah did end up going back to Nineveh, but very few people really know about the plant, the worm, and the wind. Uh, but that's chapter four, right? It's probably the least known chapter in the whole book, but it may very well be the most important chapter in the whole book. Because it is here that the primary theme of the book, which has been masterfully woven through the whole story, finally comes out into the open. This book is ultimately a story about God's compassion. It's a story about God's compassion, and that's what we see in this chapter. Last week, we began by talking about how the story of Jonah is like a play in two acts, and each act kind of echoes the other, right? In act one, God calls Jonah. Jonah flees away from this call, and yet despite his avoidance, Jonah's actions end up leading to a whole crew of sailors worshiping God, and then thrown overboard, God pray, or Jonah prays to God, and God appoints a great fish to save him. In Act 2, God calls Jonah, and this time Jonah goes where he's been called, but despite his half-hearted efforts in Nineveh, uh, the whole population, animals and people we read, repent and turn to the Lord. And then, in this final chapter, we're going to see Jonah pray once more, and God once more is going to appoint some natural phenomena to respond. This is where we see the plant, the worm, and the wind. So last week, uh, chapter 3 ended with Nineveh turning from their evil ways and God turning from the disaster that had been spoken of. Everyone is accounted for. Nineveh is accounted for. God is accounted for. Everyone is accounted for except for Jonah. What's going to happen with Jonah? Well, let's see what comes of him in chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Jonah was greatly displeased and became furious. He prayed to the Lord, Please, Lord, isn't this what I said while I was still in my own country? That's why I fled toward Tarshish in the first place. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abounding in faithful love, and one who relents from sending disaster. Now, Lord, take my life from me. It's better for me to die than to live. And the Lord asked, is it right for you to be angry 
And Jonah left the city and found a place east of it. He made himself a shelter there and sat in its shade to see what would happen to the city. And then the Lord God appointed a plant, and it grew over Jonah to provide shade for his head to rescue him from his trouble. Jonah was greatly pleased with this plant. And when dawn came the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant, and it withered. And as the sun was rising, God appointed a scorching east wind. The sun beat down on Jonah's head so much that he almost fainted, and he wanted to die. He said, it's better for me to die than to live. And then God asked Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? Yes, it's right, he replied. I'm angry enough to die. And the Lord said, You cared about the plant which you did not labor over and did not grow. It appeared in a night and perished in a night. So may I not care about the great city of Nineveh? which has more than 120,000 people who cannot distinguish between their right and their left, as well as many animals. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. Let us pray. Oh, Lord, thank you for the gift of your word. And thank you for this story that draws us into it, that invites our involvement and calls us to your compassionate heart. Lord, I pray that as we consider the words of your scripture together this morning, that you would sharpen our minds and soften our hearts, that we might know you and love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So the storytelling of Jonah is consistently surprising, right? We've mentioned throughout this book that it reads a bit like an ironic comedy uh, or, or a kind of satire of sorts. Whatever you expect to happen, precisely the opposite is what ends up happening, right? Uh, God calls his prophet to get up and go east to Nineveh, so he gets up and goes west to Tarshish, right? Um, On board the ship, all the pagan sailors are praying for rescue while this so-called prophet is down in the basement of the ship sleeping. Um, And then ultimately when he does end up getting thrown overboard, the ancient audience is on the edge of their seat expecting the great ominous Leviathan to show up and terrifyingly swallow Jonah, but it ends up just being a big fish, right? Fast forward a bit, Jonah finally ends up trekking through Nineveh, and after a single sentence, the whole population, from the greatest to the least, including people and animals, all repent. And the word gets to the king, and instead of, you know, squashing this movement in the city, he joins it, and he spreads the news further. Time and time again, this story takes the least expected twists and turns, and chapter 4 is no exception, right? After this full-scale response to Jonah's words, you would expect the prophet to rejoice, right? He has thoroughly succeeded. This is incredible. But verse 1 of chapter 4 is yet another of these unexpected turns, where we read, Jonah was greatly displeased and became furious. Jonah's not happy, but exactly the opposite. He's fuming. Now, there's even more irony in this statement in the Hebrew through some repeated words that we hear, but they don't quite come through in the English, right? So chapter 3, verse 10, the very end of chapter 3 says, God saw their actions, Nineveh, that they turned from their evil ways 
So God relented from the disaster he had threatened them with, and he did not do it. And then chapter 4 goes on, and Jonah was greatly displeased and became furious. Now, these three words are all the same word in the Hebrew. It's this Hebrew word, ra'ah, which can be translated as evil, as disaster, as trouble, as displeasure, as just bad in general. Uh, So perhaps a way to show this repetition in English would be to say, God saw their actions, that they had turned from their troubling ways. And so God relented from the trouble that he had threatened them with, and he did not do it. But Jonah was greatly troubled and became furious. You see, everyone is free of trouble except for Jonah. Everyone is delivered from evil and disaster except for Jonah. Jonah's consumed with trouble. Jonah is swimming in it. He's in a whole new ocean and a whole new belly of a whole new angry beast. And he is the angry beast. And then in verse 2, Jonah prays. And it begins like a good, humble prayer. Please, Lord. But very quickly shifts into a sort of I told you so speech from Jonah to God. Jonah says to God, isn't this what I said while I was still in my own country? That's why I fled toward Tarshish in the first place. And then at the end of the prayer, he says, and now, Lord, take my life from me. It's better for me to die than to live. So Jonah is miserable. And unlike his prayer back in chapter 2, which was a prayer for God to save his life, here in chapter 4, his prayer is for God to take his life. But in the middle of this prayer, Jonah says something incredibly important about God. Right in the middle of this prayer, what he says is, I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in faithful love, one who relents from sending disaster. This is a reference to something that God has said about himself. In fact, This is one of the primary and central revelations in the whole Old Testament. What Jonah is saying here comes from a story in Exodus, chapters 32 to 34. And from that point on, this phrase, a God compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love or faithful love, This is one of the most quoted passages throughout all the rest of the Old Testament. Over and over again, this is something that the people of God return to, remembering what God has said. So the story is, in Exodus, God, of course, delivers his people from slavery in Egypt. He delivers them through the waters of the Red Sea and to the foot of Mount Sinai, where he gives them the law and makes covenant with them. And yet, while Moses is up on the mountain receiving instructions from God, the people down on the ground become restless. And in Exodus 32, they create a golden calf. And they surround it and worship it and pray to it and offer sacrifices. I mean, this is right after they've been delivered. This is right after God has given them the law. This is right after they themselves have made covenant with God. It's a blatant betrayal of this God who has pursued them and rescued them. And so God is understandably furious 
What are you doing? And Moses is furious too. Moses comes down the mountain holding these two tablets on which the law had been held, and he's so angry, he throws them to the ground and they shatter. This covenant is broken. But Moses goes back to God and he begins to pray. And he prays for God to forgive this people. And most surprisingly, God does. God does forgive them. And then Moses continues praying, and he says to God, show me your glory. And so God begins to reveal himself even more. And we read about this in Exodus 34 where God begins to pass by Moses as Moses beholds the glory and goodness of God. And in Exodus 34, verse 6, as God is passing by, he proclaims his name. The Lord, Yahweh, the Lord, is a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in faithful love. This proclamation. And not only the words, but the story in which they occur, a story in which God's people have turned against him, and yet God shows his grace and compassion and steadfast love toward them. This proclamation is echoed again and again and again throughout the rest of Scripture. It's prayed by God's people when asking for forgiveness. It's declared by prophets when calling people to repent. It's sung by the psalmists over and over again. The Lord is a compassionate God, gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in faithful love. He is a God who, though he had every right to destroy Israel when they had betrayed him, did not, and instead forgave them. He is a God who relented from disaster, and he is a God who continues to relent from sending disaster. This is who God is. And Jonah knew that this is who God is, right? This is who God is. And just like Israel had been delivered through the waters and sat at the, at the foot of Mount Sinai, just like Moses had gone up onto the mountain, well, now here we have Jonah who's been delivered through the waters and is sitting out on perhaps some kind of a mountain, and he is repeating these very same words. But unlike everywhere else in Scripture where these words are used in worship, Jonah is using them as complaint. Here, this aspect of God's character does not move Jonah to worship, but to grumble, to complain. Instead of rejoicing in God's compassion, Jonah is angry about it because God's not being compassionate with the right people. And so he's fuming. And in verse 4, God asks Jonah a question. Is it right for you to be angry? Is it right for you to be so angry? And this is the question for our times, isn't it? We live in an age of outrage. Headlines are intentionally designed to provoke us to anger. News programs show us talking heads turning red in the face because of their anger. Folks all throughout our culture seem in many ways to wear their anger like a badge of honor, right? Look at the people I'm angry with. Look at the causes I'm angry about. It's something to be proud of in the world we live in. 
A few weeks ago, I was attending a conference that featured a speaker who's done a lot of work at the intersection of faith and politics, right? So this can obviously be a touchy subject for a lot of people, and he's received quite a bit of pushback for the work that he's done. And so at this conference, someone asked the question, hey, what is the biggest pushback that you've gotten? What's the greatest criticism that you've received in all of your work? And he thought about it for a while, and then he responded, you know, it's probably not what you'd expect. It's very rarely people on the left saying that I'm too conservative, or people on the right saying that I'm too liberal. And he does get that. But instead, he said, it's usually just people saying, you're not angry enough. You're not angry enough, right? You see, people are angry about things, and they want him to be angry about the same things. But when he's not as angry as they are, well, they get angry. They get angry about the fact that he is not as angry as they are. I mean, do you see this vicious cycle that we live in? That's the culture we live in. You need to be angry about the things that I'm angry about. And if you're not, well, that makes me angry. And we laugh. But I wonder, who are you angry at? Who are you angry with? I mean, are there certain characters that pop up on the news that start your blood boiling? Are there certain news stories that get a rise out of you? That you just want to complain about to somebody? They get your heart rate going up, your blood pressure going up a little. It's not healthy, literally. Are there people in your life that just frustrate you to no end? Are there people from your past that you still harbor bitterness and resentment toward? I mean, who are you angry with? And I want you to hear God's question. Is it right for you to be angry? Is it right for you to be so angry? Is this the attitude that God wants us to have? Is this the burden that God wants us to live in? I mean, just remember Jesus' words from the Sermon on the Mount. I tell you, everyone who's angry with his brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Whoever insults his brother or sister will be subject to the court. Whoever says, you fool, will be subject to hellfire. So if you're offering your gift on the altar and there you remember your brother or sister has something against you, well then leave your gift there in front of the altar and first go be reconciled with your brother or sister and then come and offer your gift. Jesus teaches us that Our anger toward others is something that we need to let go of as we approach worship. I mean, we're all here at worship this morning. Is it right for you to be so angry? What anger do you need to let go of? With whom do you need to be reconciled? God wants us to be free from anger. God wants us to be a people of reconciliation. 
Now, some of us may not have a great deal of anger boiling up, right? You're like, no, I'm good. And so I want you to consider this. How about yourself? Are you angry with yourself? Are you constantly hard on yourself? Maybe you're not filled with bitterness and resentment toward others, but anger and shame for yourself. And if that's you, I want you to hear this. Is it right for you to be angry? Is it right for you to be so angry and graceless toward yourself? I mean, we often think that being hard on ourselves is the right, good, religious thing to do. But truly, it is a way of resisting God's loving compassion. It's a way of resisting the transformation that God wants to bring into our lives. Being hard on yourself, condemning yourself, this is not what God wants. Is it right for you to be so angry? With this question, the book of Jonah brings us toward its final scene. Jonah's left the city of Nineveh, and he sets up a shelter where he can watch the city and wait for what will happen. Maybe it'll be destroyed after all. And then what happens is God kind of acts out a sort of parable for Jonah, right? This is a pretty common occurrence in most uh, prophet stories. God tells Isaiah to go around barefoot and naked for three years as a sign of the judgment that will come on Egypt and Cush. You read about it in Isaiah chapter 20. It's pretty weird. Uh, God tells Jeremiah to go down to the potter's house uh, as a sign of how God wants to form his people, um, God tells Ezekiel to do all kinds of weird stuff. Uh, most amusing, or well, there's a lot that's amusing. One of them uh, is he asks Ezekiel to build like a mini model of Jerusalem and then attack it over and over again. Like imagine Ezekiel with a set of Legos and then he destroys the set of Legos. This is the prophetic utterance of Ezekiel, right? He's acting out this destruction of Jerusalem as a sign for the people. God famously told Hosea to marry a prostitute as a sign of God's unfaithful people, right? I mean, over and over again, we have these stories of acted out parables that the prophets do. So, as you can tell with all of these, most of the time, it's the prophet who's acting out this sign as a message to the people. But here... And the rest of Jonah, chapter 4, God takes matters into his own hands, and God is the one who acts out a kind of parable for Jonah. So first, God appoints a plant to grow. This is the same word that was used of the great fish earlier in the story. God appointed a great fish. Well, now God appoints a plant to grow. And what a sign of God's compassion, right? While Jonah is sitting there burning over with anger, God wants to help him cool down a little and provide some shade for him. The shade of a plant that verse 6 says is to rescue him from his trouble. There's that same word, the, the trouble that Jonah is filled with and overflowing with. God wants to rescue him from it with compassion. And then it says, Jonah was greatly pleased. This is the first time Jonah's in a good mood in the whole book, and all it took was a plant. That's pretty, I mean, that's great. Uh, Jonah is greatly pleased. This is exactly the opposite of what we've read in verse 1. Verse 1 says, Jonah was greatly displeased. 
but in the compassionate shade of this plant, he is greatly pleased. And this is good. This is beautiful. But for the parable to have its full effects, it must continue. So next, God appoints a worm to attack the plant, and the plant withers up. And then, as the sun rises, God appoints a scorching east wind to blow. Now, here in the Pacific Northwest, we cannot understand the full meaning of a scorching wind. If there's a wind, we're cold, and we're going to put on a sweater, right? I mean, every wind that blows here is cool. Um, But this is not true in the Middle East. I I once had an overnight layover in Dubai during the summer, and uh, I'll never forget getting off the airplane and getting to walk through the city a little bit. It was a windy day, and that wind felt like walking in front of an earth-sized hairdryer. I mean, it was just hot air blowing uh, right, and of course, you know, it blows up the sand that's all around too, so you got little bits of hot sand flowing in your face. It's not the most exciting thing. So, I mean, I'm just imagining Jonah sitting there with this scorching wind and perhaps sand blowing on him, and then it says the sun is beating down on his head. That's the same word that was used to describe the worm attacking the plant. Now the sun is attacking Jonah's head. Jonah's great pleasure is quickly sapped up. And once more, he becomes furious. And so with the parable complete, God now asks again in verse 9, Jonah, is it right for you to be so angry about this plant? And Jonah finally just explodes. Yes! Yes, it is! It's right for me to be angry. I'm angry enough to die. God is described as slow to anger. This is not true of Jonah. And so with Jonah's cards on the table, he's finally answered the question. Yeah, I'm angry, and I think I'm right about it. God will now bring home this little enacted parable. And he says to Jonah, you cared about the plant, which you did not labor over. It appeared in one night and perished in one night. So may I not care about the great city of Nineveh, which has more than 120,000 people who can't distinguish between their right and their left. And don't forget about all the animals. They repented too. And that's where the book of Jonah leaves us, with this question to ponder. I I loved, Orva, your opening this morning. Uh, God uses this question, should I not care about the great city of Nineveh, which has more than 120,000 people? Uh, This is an, an invitation to consider the human family of belonging. I've created all of them. Can't I care about them? So just as this enacted parable has stirred up so many emotions within Jonah's heart, It is meant to let us in on God's heart. It's meant to show us what God's heart is like. If Jonah cared about this plant that appeared in a night and perished in a night, how much more does God care about this great city of 120,000 people and the animals? If Jonah was greatly pleased by the flourishing of this plant, well then how much more is God greatly pleased by the flourishing of this city as they turn to him with faith? This is the heart 
of a compassionate and gracious God who is slow to anger and abounding in faithful love. God is a compassionate God, and God's love goes beyond anything that we've ever imagined. This is the whole point of Jonah. And this is much of what Jesus sought to teach his followers as well. I mean, just as God uses this kind of parable to teach his prophet, well, Jesus also used many parables to teach his people. And there's at least two of them that come to mind. One of them is from Luke chapter 15. Uh, The crowds are gathered around, and it says this, all the tax collectors and sinners were approaching to listen to Jesus, and the Pharisees and scribes were complaining. Hmm, just like Jonah. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So Jesus told some parables. He tells a parable about a shepherd that loses one of his sheep, and he goes off to find it, leaves 99 in order to find the one. And when he does find the one and brings it back, he greatly rejoices, for it had been lost, but now it was found. And then he tells a story about a woman who lost a coin and went looking for it all over the place. And when she found it, she greatly rejoiced because it was lost, but now it's found. And then he tells another story that we often know as the prodigal son. And I love the way that uh, Tim Keller, uh, author and, and pastor, describes the story of Jonah. He has a book entitled The Prodigal Prophet. And he says that Jonah is both sons wrapped into one. And the first half of the story of Jonah, Jonah is the son that ran away from the father. And in the second half of the story of Jonah, Jonah is the older son who's angry about the younger son being welcomed back home. This is the story of the prodigal son who runs away and comes back. And Luke 15 describes the older son as the father welcomes that younger son back home, and it says he became angry and didn't want to go into the celebration that the father was throwing. So his father came out and pleaded with him. Isn't that exactly what we're reading here in Jonah? Jonah's angry. And so God comes out and pleads with him. And the father in this parable says, Son, you're always with me. Everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost, and now he is found. This is the heart of a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And you see, Jonah knew this, right? I mean, Jonah said, I knew that you were like this. But one of the questions at the heart of the book of Jonah is how far does this compassion extend, right? I mean, Jonah knows that God's been compassionate to Israel, but this is Nineveh we're talking about, right? This reminds me of another parable that Jesus tells in Luke chapter 10. There's a man that approaches him and says, teacher, what should we do to be saved? And Jesus tells him, well, the greatest commandment is this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. Oh, and the second as well is love your neighbor as yourself. Do these and you will be saved. And so 
the man says, yes, this is good, this is true. But then the text says, but wanting to justify himself, he asked, so who exactly is my neighbor? You say I have to love my neighbors, but I mean, who are we talking about, right? And so Jesus tells a parable about a man who is beaten and left for dead on the side of the road. And first, a religious leader, a priest, comes by. And he sees him there and quickly crosses the other side of the road, keeps going. Second, another esteemed religious leader comes by, a Levite. Sees this man, crosses by the other side of the road, and quickly moves on. And finally, a Samaritan? Those people who none of us like or want to be with or think highly of comes by and sees this man on the side of the road and lifts him up, bandages his wounds, brings him to an end, pays for him to stay there for a night and make sure he's well cared for. And at the end of the story, Jesus asks a question not unlike a question, the question that God asks Jonah. Jesus asks the question, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? And he responds, well, the one who showed compassion to him. And Jesus said to him, go and do the same. This is what the parable that God acts out with Jonah is about as well. This is the same question that God asks Jonah. It's the question that Jesus asks his followers. What does it mean to be a neighbor? It means to extend the compassion of God. And so the book of Jonah ends somewhat abruptly with a question. We don't get to hear Jonah's response. We don't know what Jonah does or doesn't do. If he continues fuming and angry or if he finally feels convicted and turns. But that's not really the point of the book. Because the question is for us. Will we extend the compassion that God has extended? Will we love the people that we don't want to love? Will we allow ourselves to be enlarged by the heart of God that is greater than we could ever know? At the very center of the book of Jonah is this proclamation, salvation belongs to the Lord. Do we believe that? Do we believe that salvation is not ours to give or take or hold on to, but it's God's? Do we believe that God can show compassion even to those we would rather not? Is it right for us to be so angry? The answer is clearly no. And so let us let go of our anger and instead receive the heart of God so that we might be the compassionate people of our compassionate God. Amen.